excited to jump into to the Word of God this morning. We're going to continue a study on Proverbs. Uh, so if you pray with me, that'd be wonderful. Lord, uh, I give you my words. I pray that uh, my words that come up would be true. I pray that if there's anything in me that's not uh, from you, I pray that I would go away. I pray that, that you would be edified. I pray that, that as my words go forth, that they would not just go forth here, but they would go forth into the world and even uh, stir up heaven. And, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I like to start uh, kind of with a big picture. It's kind of how, how I work, because every sermon that I give, I love to have something that you can take home and actually go and do. Uh, but I love to paint the bigger picture. So we're just going to kind of work down uh, the funnel, uh, so to speak. And so we'll get to, get to a point. Today's point of my message, uh, just so you know, is I need all of us to be coachable. That your heart has to, has to be teachable. And that it's, it's God's design for you to be coached by other people and for you to coach other people. That's what God's design, and so we uh, are, are going to dive into that a little bit. I used to think that uh, God was really fragile. You know, I, as I grow and I, I get older, I know a little bit more about God, but you know, one thought that I used to have is that God was really fragile, and let me explain. You used to, you know, you come in, you sing songs at church like, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, uh, and maybe if you had somebody that could sing as good as Isaac and Lois, maybe the Holy Spirit would want to come. But probably if I'm singing, that probably is not good enough. So we got to get somebody that's better to sing, and then maybe the Holy Spirit will show up. And then, you know, if, if all of us are in the room, we all should have had to have lived just absolutely perfect lives, said just the right thing, oh, I, I shouldn't have cussed that one time. And you just live through this life where we think that God's Spirit on us is fragile, that it can easily just be gone in just a second. So we live and we walk on tiptoes around God like, oh, I hope I, I, hope I don't offend you. I hope I, I hope I don't shock you by who I actually am. I hope this doesn't catch you off guard. That's how I think. You pray for someone and you go, you know, maybe if I squint my eyes just enough, that will mean I have more faith. Isn't that absurd? We're talking about God, the God that made you, the God that made me, the God that made the earth. He's not shocked, and he's not fragile. He's strong. He's completely capable. He's completely understanding. He completely knows, and he's okay with you. He's good with you. He's a, he's a great guy. And here's what I, as I get to know God a little bit more, and think, I'm, I don't know God, I don't know God, everything about God today, but I know the most I've ever known. And I'm trending in a direction of knowing him more, and I'll ask you, which way are you trending this morning? Are you getting to know him more too? You don't have to have all your, your questions answered right at this moment, but are you pursuing him? Are you seeking him? And here's what I know about God. He's not fragile. You know, I think, I used to think, oh, the Spirit only fell on people if they were righteous enough. That the gifts only came out if they were good enough. You know what I realize now? I can't go anywhere without seeing the gift of God on, any, on everyone. I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care who, who you're serving. If you're serving yourself or you're serving another God, I can see the Spirit of God in you and what He made you to do. He's not fragile. He actually just made you. He made all of us. He made the world. And so deep down in every single one of us, there is something that has been placed in there, and it's for God's glory. And we have a choice to either use that for him or for our own profit. And so you have a lot of people in the world, and you go, why is this famous person famous? Probably because of the gift of God. I look at a celebrity and go, man, they are gifted. Where did that gifting come from? Where did that voice come from? I say it's from God. And some, at some point, I'm starting to go, man, I used to think God could only be worshipped in one moment. And now I'm going, man, he, if he's everywhere, I get to see him and be thankful for him in every single area of my life. I get to look at each and every one of you and go, there is something that's God-given in your life that I don't have, that your neighbor doesn't have, but you have, and it's for a purpose. And when I see you, I, think, I thank God for you. 
I start to love you more. And so instead of only a few people having the Spirit of God, he's actually showing me that everyone has the Spirit of God. God is on everyone. So how do you balance? Because this is, I'll just be honest, when I look at everyone, though, I don't just see perfect godliness. Like you see the things inside of people that you go, man, that's from God. But then on the flip side, no matter how hard you try not to, you just see, but I also see the humanity. I also see the flaws in this person. And you go, I shouldn't, I shouldn't try to see the flaws. I, I know I should be better. I, want, I just want to look at the, the best in them. But man, it doesn't matter how, you, I could have the most anointed and wise person and you're starting to see the humanity in them. You could have the person that you think is the furthest from God and I'm starting to see the spirit of God in them. And so within each and every one of us, you have some divine appointment and you also have your carnal nature. And how do, we balance, how do we balance them? Which one are you focusing more on? Well, the great thing is God has a plan for, for both of us. He has a plan for calling out the good in you. And there's also a plan uh, for being corrected. But to be the big picture, I like to start with the end in mind. Okay? You, you got to start at the end to know where you're going. And let's just, let's just where are we going? Well, Jesus is coming back someday. And what, whether you, how much you believe that will determine a lot about how you live your life. Jesus is coming back. And this time he's coming back, his second time coming, he's not coming to die for you again because he already did that. And so if you live in full of shame, if you're feeling full of guilt, if you feel like you need a fresh start, well, he's already paved the way for you to have all of that. And so when he's coming the second time, he's not coming so you can be free from sin because he already did that. He's already paved a way for you to do that. And so why is he coming? He's coming back to love you, to love us. The, the most, the, the most uh, used picture of Jesus' second coming is a wedding. The terminology that he uses is bride and groom. We are the bride. The church collective is the bride. Jesus is the groom. And so when you go to a wedding... You're going there because there's love in the air. When Jesus comes back for his second coming, he's not coming to free you from your sins. He's coming to love you. And so what is our response to that? If you really believe that, well, you do like every good person does when they're going to get married. They get ready. You have to be ready. Are you preparing like you know that he's coming back? I don't know when he's coming back. I just know that he is. And so I can, I can bank everything on it. I have banked everything on it. I want to live my life and try to be better, as good as I can be, so that I can be ready for when Jesus comes back. I want to be ready. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back to love us. And here's the one view of God that I've, I've thought of him a lot, and I've prayed prayers like this where I go, God, uh, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Anybody ever prayer to pray like that? Oh, I'm, in a, I'm in a situation right now. God, if you could just tell me what to do right now, this would be really helpful. Man, even better, can you just give me a checklist? I know the Bible is your word, but it's not specific enough for me. And so can you actually just tell me what to do and I will do it. He's coming back to love us, not control us. Because you can be in love with somebody or, or you can control them, but you cannot do both. If you are in control of somebody, your love can only go so far. Imagine, that I, you know, I have a bride. Jesus is coming back for us, his bride. And I love her, and I'm so thankful for her. And so imagine if I wake up every morning, and I'm, I rise and shine. Uh, hey, Rach, how's it going? That's not how it ever happens. But I'm like, oh, how's it going, Rach? You know, Rach, you are wonderful, but here's a list of things that I'd like you to fix today uh, about yourself. Uh, you could really do a better job. Uh, you know, I really haven't appreciated the way that you are, uh, and so I want you to, I want you to be somebody different uh, and, and then just accommodate. Thank you and, and whatever. Have a good day. How's that going to go for me? Vice versa. How, if she does the same and goes, even... Maybe it's not that extreme. Maybe it's just, uh, I don't like that about you. Well, I don't like that about you. That's more realistic. 
It, just throw little jabs here and there. Guess what happens? Over time, you guys are trying to control. Me and Rachel would be trying to control each other, and what we would lose is the intimacy. Because you can be intimate or you can be in control, but you cannot be both. And so why is Jesus coming back? He's coming back for a bride that he wants to love. And so isn't it, it, it can't be God's nature if love is not controlling, then he's not looking to just give you everything that you have to do. Because he would rather be in love with you than in control of you. And so our prayers aren't God's nature if we're going, oh, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, I'm so faithful and I just want to do exactly what you do. I want to, I want to receive the complete blessing. And he's going, thank you. I, I, he probably appreciates it. It's the thought that counts. But he's trying to love us. And vice versa, he wants us to love him back. And so what we have to take out of the equation is control. Maybe God's not actually trying to tell you everything that you're doing wrong. Maybe that's just a perceived thought in our head. Maybe we don't actually know God if we think that he's always mad at us, if he's always trying to change us. Maybe we should start being just okay and living, and we'll go go from there. My my grandpa, my mom's dad... uh, my grandma and grandpa have been married for like 60 years. And so you go to a wedding, like I have a lot of cousins, and we go to weddings. And uh, if you've been to a wedding, maybe there's been a generational dance where you bring all the couples onto the dance floor, and they dance, and the DJ says, if you've been married for two hours, you have to leave the dance floor. Or if you've been married for five years, and so on, until you find who's been married the longest. And so my grandma and grandpa are almost always the people that have been married the longest. And so the DJ will say, do you have any wise words for the newlywed couple? And now I start to laugh because I know exactly what my grandpa's going to say. He said it every wedding, uh, and he will say it until he dies. And so, and I've appreciated about that. And so he will always grab the microphone, he will look at the groom, and he goes, listen, I got two words for you, two words that will help you in your life, help you to make it to 60 years. You want to know what they are? Yes, dear. Dear. And everyone chuckles like that <laughs> at the wedding where they go, ha that's nice. Happy wife, happy life. Okay, okay. I think he's smart. I used to think it was kind of cheesy. But I think he might be on to something. Because it seems like he would rather be in love with my grandma than in control of her. And so you could say, oh, you're just a pushover. You're just doing whatever. No, he's actually choosing to be in love rather than just pointing out all the flaws. Because we all have flaws. Is there anybody in here that does not have a flaw? Because you should come and preach. Well, I'd love to know. But we all have the flaws. And so if we're supposed to love people, maybe we should choose to love them rather than be in control. And the, and the person who's doing it the most is Jesus Christ towards us. He's not always just looking to tell you what to fix. So it could be a good thing if you come to church and you walk out and you go, man, I don't really even know what I learned, but I just love Jesus. That's probably where we should all be. Oh, I walk out of here, man, I love Jesus. Man, it was great to worship him. I don't really remember what Caleb said, but man, I'm encouraged. Fantastic. He's not always trying to take a, a, a knife out to do surgery. And so if our correction, because I've, I've said this, where I say to uh, myself, I go, you know, if there's anything in me that God wants to correct, he'll tell me. Or I'll look at other people and I go, well, I see that kind of flaw, but maybe God's okay with it because, well, he hasn't said anything to them, and so I guess I shouldn't be judgmental. And so I, I, I kind of put the blame on God and the effort on God to make the world what it should be. When in reality, he has given us the choice. And so I'm surrendering the very thing that God is actually putting on us. Here's what Jesus says. Let's open your Bible if you have it. It will be on the screen too. To uh, Matthew 7. Because everyone has the Spirit of God in them and everyone has flaws. So what do we do? How do we balance that? 
And this is what Jesus says. Seven, Matthew 7, 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I'm sure people have heard this. In fact, you may have even used it if somebody says something to you and you go, take the plank out of your own eye. Look who's talking. Shuts people up pretty, cra- uh, pretty fast. When you go, hey, look at you. You're no better. And that's how I've sometimes read this is go, oh, I'm a hypocrite. No one wants to be a hypocrite. And so how dare I judge somebody else for their, for their actions? I better just not say anything. What does Jesus actually say? Let's look at the actual truth of what Jesus says. What's true? Is there a plank in your eye? Yes, there is. Is there a piece of sawdust in your brother's eye or your friend's eye? Yes. Should either of them be there? No. When I read the words, you hypocrite, what I've done, I have done this, is I go, I stop there and go, I guess I better not say anything. I guess I better not do anything. What does Jesus actually say? You hypocrite, that's where I stop, and just go, I guess I better not say anything. There's what he actually instructs us. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Who removes the speck, and who removes the plank? You do. We do. I've said things like this. I better take the plank out of my own eye, and you know what? Jesus is going to take care of them. Is that what Jesus himself said? He said, take the plank out of your eye so that you can see clearly to take the speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye. And so we're comparing, it's almost like we sometimes compare sin, regardless of how big it is, it shouldn't, none of it should be there. And whose job is it to deal with it? It's actually ours. It's called coachability. Are you willing to receive instruction from other people? Finally getting into the book of Proverbs. I got one. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Does anybody like this sound? (laughs) You do, coach? (laughs) You want to hold the knife? Okay. As iron sharpens iron. There's friction. It's not, un- it's not comfortable, but as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. How do you get sharper? How do you become more that God made you to be? It's actually kind of the same substance grinding on it. It's the same, if a person helps a person, they both get sharper. Actually, earlier in that proverb, 27.5, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Better is a rebuke than hidden love. So we could walk around and you say, oh yeah, I love them, but you don't say anything. You know what scriptural, godly wisdom says? It's better to have somebody that will rebuke you than someone that just says they love you and doesn't do anything. Not only that, a wound from a friend is better than an enemy that multiplies kisses. Better is somebody that can, oh, I see your flaw, boop, I poked it. I know where your wound's at. I found the wound. Better to have a friend that pokes the wound than an enemy that just walks and says, oh, you're so good. Oh, you're so great. We love you. We love you. That's what your soul, you think you want. But what you really need is somebody that's willing to get in there and go, hey, this is where we're at. Because we're supposed to be ready. Jesus is coming back. Big picture. Jesus is coming back. We got to be ready. How do you get ready? We help each other get ready. Who is speaking into your life? Who are you speaking into? You might say you have a group of friends. Are you guys actually able to say what you say behind their back in front of them? That's what you need. You're able to get, give the truth in love. 
and go, hey, I know this doesn't make, I know this won't feel good in the moment, but you actually give it. And so if I have a friend that walks up and says, Caleb, I don't think you're talking to your wife very well. And I go, thank you, brother. I'm going to fix that. Who's most thankful? My wife, Rachel. So if a friend walks up to me and says, Caleb, I think it would be great for you to, to work on a creative outlet so the creativity that God's put inside of you will come out. Okay, thanks. I'll try to do that. Who's most thankful? God. Because you know what he gets to do, and the same would be example for my wife, is they see the correction, but they aren't controlling. So they get to remain in love, remain intimate, without having to be the one that's in control. And so if you want to if you, if you grow in love with God, maybe stop praying prayers like, God, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. If you want to grow in love with him, I would start doing something like this. I would find people to speak into my life. Here's what's happened. This, hap- this is what God's teaching me, so I'm, I'm going through this just as much. Uh, I go, God, th- this is a big picture. Two years ago, you know, Pastor Fred preached on the fear of the Lord two weeks ago. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so I, I want to be more afraid of not being with God than it is to, to be with him. I want, I, want to, uh, I want to fear what he says. So that way I live the way he wants me to live. I don't want to be away from him. And so I prayed a prayer like this. Holy Spirit, would you teach me how to make Jesus the Lord of my life? And he started for two years. Every couple weeks, there was something new that I needed to do, something new that I needed to lay down, someone new that I needed to go forgive. And there was very practical things that just popped into my head. It wasn't like an audible voice. It was just kind of like the way you get an idea. You go, oh, I should do that. And then there's kind of some conviction down in the belly to do it. That's the fear of the Lord. It's the conviction that you feel is going, I have to do this. And so I was doing these different things that God has asked me to do, and I've preached on some of them. But about six or eight months ago, all of a sudden, that kind of checklist of things to do has kind of been going away. And I go, okay, well, this can't be right because if I'm, you know, I'm 26, there's no way that I can, that I'm perfect. This is not true. There's got to be more to learn. There's got to be more to, to, to understand about God. And why is God not telling me? Oh, maybe that's because I'm not living the right way. Or maybe I did something wrong. Or maybe uh, he's fragile and went away. No, this is what God showed me. He goes, I'm just trying to be in love with you. The correction comes from other people. And the correction comes when you invite it. And so what I did last Sunday is I walked up to a friend. And I was trying to learn about investing money. And so I had kind of some thoughts that were going around. I was doing some research, and I was like, you know, I just, I need a coach. And so I found somebody that was smarter than I am, knows more than I do, and I walked up to him, and I said, hey, I've had this idea and this idea. Can you help me hash it out? And he goes, great, we're going to need more time. So he invites me over to his house on Tuesday, and we spend hours together just talking together. It was so refreshing for me, and I'm going, should I do this or this? And he's like, you should do this. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it was, it felt like God was speaking straight through him. And he would probably never say, oh yeah, God just talks through me all the time. But that's what was happening. God was, it was like his words coming out were just exactly what I needed to, needed to hear. Now, could have God told me that? Sure. Sure he could have, but here's why he did it. A, he'd rather be in love with you than in control. And guess what else happened? Well, me and this guy are now a little bit closer friends. We have something else to talk about, something more to bond over. We trust each other just a little bit more. I got the good, I got the good advice. I went home. It's like 1130 at night. I'm usually absolutely passed out by then. It's way past my bedtime. And I'm wide awake, wired, because God's spirit is just so alive in me and he's speaking even more. It's kind of like if you were going to hear a, a sermon or you went somewhere with your wife or your husband and on the way home, it starts a whole new conversation. It goes to a whole new level. That's kind of what happened with me and God. So here's what happened. I humbled myself, walked up to somebody and said, coach me. Now I have a friend who I'm a little bit closer to and God is talking to me more. It sounds a lot like when Jesus said, The first commandment you should do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. 
Why does God want our corrections to come through each other? Probably because it makes you love him more and it makes you love each other more. It's kind of his plan. And so I just want to invite you today in view that Jesus is coming back and for us to be ready, if you really want to be ready, you should be coachable. Is there anybody that can tell you and rebuke you? It's a strong word. It's kind of uncomfortable. Is there anybody that can speak against you? And then that you actually receive it. So here's what I would do. Okay? Coachability. Teachability. That's the word of the day. Are you coachable? Are you teachable to those, to those around you? And here's how I would, what I would do first. The first step that I would do if you're actually convinced that this is a way to get ready for Jesus' return. First thing I would do is go home, find a quiet place, and I'd do it today. And I would pray a prayer like this. Jesus, we may not be as close as I thought, or we may not be as close as I've wanted, or maybe we were in the past, but I would like to be. And so, Holy Spirit, would you teach me how to love Jesus more? And then shut up and listen to your thoughts, what pops into your head. And he'll tell you. It'd be the equivalent of if I walked in, uh, walk, go home from church, and I go, Rich, we haven't been as close as we've been in the past. You know, the last three or four months have been kind of tough. And I know, you know, there's probably things that you could do. I just want to own up for me. Is there anything that I can do better to be a better husband? Now, is Rachel controlling me? No. I'm inviting the correction. And so when she gives it, she will give the best advice for our marriage because it's in the marriage. And so it's the same thing with God. First step to being coachable is get, get his opinion. Not waiting and go, I'm probably good unless God tells me. No, you get on your knees and go, God, I know, that I, I know that I can be closer to you. Show me how. And then in gentleness, he'll give you. And then the fear of the Lord says, well, I better do it. <laughs> but then that's not usually where you, you live forever. Then he goes, hey, great, we're just in love. And then you got to turn to your friends. You shouldn't turn to everyone because everyone has a different opinion. So here's what I would do. Five people. Call them my fave five. You go to five people and you go, I give you ultimate authority of my life. I give you ultimate ability to speak in whenever, about whatever. Because we can't trust ourselves. You're, if you know you're being deceived, it's not deception. Who, who's able to, who able to get your back? probably the friend that's outside of your deception. And so we got to have five people. And so I like to have people that are close to me that will speak into my life. Uh, and I, I invite that. I don't wait and assume that they should know. I go and say, hey, I respect you. I respect the way you live, how you hear from God. And so I'm saying, if there's ever anything that you want to change in my life, I give you ultimate ability to do that. And then you do it. If you give away the authority, you can't then go, well, I didn't like what you said there. You have to actually then follow through and do it. And so is there anybody that comes to mind? If you go, I don't really have one, don't go ahead and pick five. Pick one first. There's got to be trusted people. You shouldn't just put anybody on the list, but you should have a list. And then lastly, uh, are you bold enough to speak into somebody else's life? You go, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Well, you can either step on their toes or they can just keep walking and die. Which is more painful? I'll say that bluntly, but we're so afraid to step on people's toes and go, I don't want to over, overstep boundaries. Well, they're walking in a bad direction that will cause a lot more pain than stepping on toes. Now, can you just go stepping on anybody's toes? No, I call it a trust bank. Just in the same way you have money in the bank, if you have more trust with somebody and trust comes with time, then you have more ability to speak into their life because iron sharpens iron, it's friction. So usually if you give a rebuke to somebody else, something they probably don't like to hear, do they sit there and go, man, I love that so much, it makes me feel so good. I hate finding out what I'm doing wrong. But I have to choose into it anyway. No one likes finding out that they have a flaw. 
okay? We all know we have it, but for some reason we just don't want to hear about it. And so we just assume that we have it, but we're not going to name it. And so when someone else names it, we go, I don't like that. It's friction. And then the person who brought it up goes, maybe I did the wrong thing. Maybe I said the wrong thing. Well, in the moment, your trust bank may go down, but ultimately it was able to grow even stronger. And so if you uh, have been friends with somebody for 20 years and you've never spoken in their life, you may just be an enemy that multiplies kisses. Maybe you haven't spoken in. And maybe, oh, it might be rough for six hours. But once they go, man, I'm thankful that I have a friend that will speak into my life. Now, if you've only met somebody for six hours and you go up and rebuke them, well, you just ruin that, rent, that friendship. <laughs> if you walk up to somebody that, hey, you guys aren't actually close, there's no trust there, well, you don't have the opportunity to speak into their life. But if you've got kids, you speak into their life. Even if you have adult kids, you speak into their life. Your parents, if you're older, you have the ability, because there's trust, to go, hey, I don't do this all the time. You know that. But I'm really serious that I've seen this in you, and it causes me to have some concern. Let's talk about it. That's what it means to take the plank out of your own eye. But then also, you go gently, and you are the one that removes the sawdust from the other person's eye. Everything is done in humility, and everything is done in love. And ultimately, this plan of God's, when it works... It makes you love God more. It makes you love other people more. Does that make sense? Yes. Go be coachable. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray. I just want you to think, find one person. Maybe you have a list. Maybe you don't have a list. But I want you to think about who is somebody that you want to add to the list. And I, the, the homework this week is if you, if you really believe this, if you really want to be ready for Jesus to return, go invite somebody to correct you. All right? So I pray in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would show each person in here uh, something, someone that can just speak into their life. I pray that when we go home and we ask, Lord, is there any way that you can, that I can love you more, that we would be able to discern and listen to that as well. But we understand that we, we need to rely on each other. And so I pray that our circle of influence would grow, that our circle of coachability would grow so that we could ultimately be ready for your return and be in love with you. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.